Hello and welcome back to Catch and Cook California. I'm Kevin. Today we're headed out to the Eastern Sierra for the tail end of trout season. We're gonna do a little bit of foraging, a little bit of fishing, some catching and some cooking. Let's go. to go do some trout fishing in the eastern Sierra. I don't usually uh, film in the car because I feel like most of us spend way too much time in the car anyway and traffic and whatnot, but I had to show you this. I wonder what's on the radio. So some people uh, would say that means I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'd say that means I'm exactly where I want to be. of mine had this book and uh, I checked it out. I really like it. It's uh, sort of a cursory identification of a number of different plants, animals, fungi, etc. It's got a lot of information and at least it'll let you know in general what things could be and then you can go and look up the Latin name and then you can do more research on that particular plant to see if it is what you found. So having something like this and then a more in-depth guide together, I think would be a great idea, but I definitely like it. It's got all kinds of stuff on wild plants. It's got stuff on your local snakes, stuff on your local birds, stuff on your local rodents. And one of the coolest things I thought was it had a whole page that was dedicated to wild currants and gooseberries and things like that right after I saw this wax current over here. do a little bit of foraging and uh, hopefully make some wild berry pancakes. This plant right here is the wax currant. It's got beautiful little fruit that are just coming into prime. Check this out. So there's your fruit with that trumpet-like flower that's sticking off one end. It's very distinct. And then there's the leaf sort of like halfway between a fan shape and a maple shape. I'd make a tall stack or at the very least a short stack, but there's not a lot of these on here. So I just want to grab a few, give it a little taste. I can't do pancakes without first making some coffee. Boom. Blossom free, wax currants. This is my go-to uh, for pancakes. It's whole wheat, Kodiak cakes. Um, I really do like that because it sticks to your ribs a little bit longer than just regular you know, buttermilk white flour pancakes. Um, they're heartier, I think they're better. And the cool thing about these guys is you don't have to mix anything other than water in here. So it has you know powdered milk, powdered egg, all that stuff is already in it. So all you gotta do is bring this mix and water and you got pancakes. I only need two silver dollar pancakes because we didn't forage a ton of these wax currants, but I definitely wanna give them a taste test. So that should be about right. Wanna make sure we get any lumps out, any dry flour, make sure it's all nice and even batter. We're adding in those beautiful currants now that I've removed all the blossoms. You can also use a little bit of oil, a little bit of butter. I wouldn't do straight butter because it tends to burn, but a little bit of oil mixed in there and then it won't burn. And then you get that nice nutty butter flavor. Nice and golden brown, ready to go. Ooh, ooh, ooh. All right, this is something my neighbors gave us. Runamook maple syrup, Vermont organic. Sounds good to me. This is the legit stuff right here. Let's not forget that coffee. Ooh -wee. All 
Okay. Mm, mm, mm. It's breakfast time. It's a good one. You can see the current right there. Mm. Mm. The um, the currents are pretty subtle. Yeah, there's not much of a citrusy, like not much of a sourness. They're really quite sweet, but they're good. That's good coffee. One of my favorite things about going out and foraging and then cooking out in a spot like this you cannot beat the ambiance. And it's a connection with your environment that you would not get any other way. You cannot find native wax current pancakes at even the most high-end Michelin star restaurant. You simply can't. So if you want this experience, the only way to get it is right out here in the wild. There we go. I hope these videos encourage folks like you to get out in the woods and enjoy these experiences. Remember, don't eat anything that you're not 100% positive on your identification about. You should be confident enough that you would feed it to a baby before you eat it yourself. Don't feed it to a baby before you eat it yourself, but you know what I mean. You should have zero doubt. 100% confidence is not 99% confidence. But if you are, you know, a lot of these berries are very easy to ID. Mushrooms, it depends on the species, but a lot of mushrooms and plants can be learned. So if this is of interest to you, I highly recommend that you go out and you study this. All right, I'm walking past a lot of very slow moving water. It's pretty shallow, does not look great for me. I'm looking for riffles. I wanna find the base of the rapid, a deep hole, maybe some snags, fallen trees, etc. The kind of structure that might hold some fish. The real shallow water, I don't typically have any luck, so I'm just walking past this. It's very, very beautiful. Don't get me wrong, but if I want to have luck catching fish, I want to get to those deeper water spots right at the base of a riffle or actually within the riffle.
That is the biggest trout I've ever caught out of this river. Wow, 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 wow. Hang on, buddy, hang on. I'm gonna bop this guy because I'm definitely keeping him. That is an absolutely massive trout. Yeah, I've been trout fishing since I was a kid, and that is my PB right there. It wasn't a long fight, but that was a good fight. Thank you, beauty. Thank you, thank you. Wait, wait, wait. Give them one solid wrap to the back of the head. Make sure it's good and solid. You know, you're not trying to, uh, like you need to hit it hard so it doesn't suffer. I always give it two, just to be sure. If it glances off the side, that's not a solid hit, so you may have to do three, but the first one should be the one that does it. So a flick of the wrist, smack it with a good hard rock right on the back of the head, and it's lights out. Check this fish out. Dude, that is huge. <laughs> oh, what a beauty. Oh, that is, I am beside myself. That is the biggest trout I have ever caught in a river in California. So excited. All right, so we bonked him. I'm gonna show you how to make a makeshift stringer that allows us to keep the fish in the water. And the water is nice and cold, so it's gonna keep it refrigerated while I continue to fish. I know there's a lot of sticks in the way. I'll show you why I'm cutting this one where I'm cutting it right now. This is Willow. So I'm gonna score around. This is a dead Willow branch, so it does no harm at all to the tree, but Willows are storm adapted. So even if you cut green Willow, this is what happens to them naturally every season. They get a bunch of boulders rolling down, they get broken limbs, and they're adapted to it. So if a branch flows downstream, it lands in a bank. If it's a green branch of willow, it'll sprout a new tree. So this part right here is super important. I left a little on the end, that's also very important. I'm gonna cut it way up here. So I'm just gonna score in all the way around just to weaken the uh, exterior wood there, bend it around a little bit, and off it comes. I'm gonna cut this guy right about here. Remember, always cutting away from yourself. So it looks like that. I'm gonna sharpen down this to a bit better of a point. Very, very easy knife work here. Just like this. This is something I learned from my dad when I was a kid, and it's brilliant. It's uh, super easy, but works great. So now that I've dispatched this massive trout, I'm gonna run this guy through the gill. So that hook is gonna hold it. Remember we got this little spike? That's gonna go into the mud so this stays in the water. I'm gonna anchor it down with some rocks. And that'll keep it secure. Now what I'm not gonna do is anchor this out in the fast water. That'd be a good way to lose a beautiful prized fish like this. Instead, a little spot like this, it has a nice little corral. And that's the perfect spot for uh, my refrigerator here. So I'm gonna anchor this down. So now I wedge that point down underneath this rock. I put a rock on top to keep it in place. And I took a rock out of the river and set it up on top of the stick too, so there's nowhere for it to go. Fish is entirely underwater, and this water is coming straight off the stream here, so it's nice and cool. So one thing you're gonna see me do a whole lot, and I never even realized that I did this until I started making this video, you're gonna see me reeling and moving the rod around like this. I'm not trying to pretend like I have a lightsaber, also, don't play with lightsabers, that's dangerous. What I'm doing instead is I'm casting out, landing in one spot, and as the river is flowing, it's gonna direct my lure wherever it really wants to go. The only control I have over it is whether or not I put the rod tip here, it might go around this way around a rock, or over here, it might come around this way. So I'm trying to direct it to go through the best pools as it's coming downstream. The other thing you'll notice that I'm doing is I'll be reeling very fast. That's if I'm in the flow, like this right here. And then I'll slow it down. That's when I'm up in a pool, like way, way up here. And that keeps your lure moving at a pretty consistent speed. If you reel too fast in the calm water up here, you're gonna be just on the surface and it's gonna go by too quickly. If you reel too slow down here, your, your lure's just gonna be tumbling around. So you really kind of have to play with it, watch the lure, see what it looks like through the water, and then kind of judge your speed as you're going. Let's go try to find a better hole, and I'll show you what I mean. The 
the water seems to still be moving too fast here. I'm gonna go up there, right there. There's a nice deep pool, so I'm gonna position myself between here and there and cast into it. That is a black bear right here, for sure. Pretty cool. So we're gonna clean this one. I'm gonna keep it really simple today. I'm just gonna do a single trout in the frying pan and then I'm just gonna make a, a nice little gourmet salad to go with it. My salad, got some Kalamata olives, got some Greek feta on there, salt and pepper, cucumber, lettuce, tomato. Super simple, little uh, olive oil and balsamic vinegar. Been craving my vegetables out here. And then we've got fried to golden brown perfection, beautiful trout, a little bit of onion, caramelized in there, a little bit of garlic, salt and pepper. Look at that, perfect. Here we go, don't drop it Kev. Skin on there. Mmm! Oh baby, that's good. That's the fin. Like a little potato chip. Beautiful. And a big old piece like that. Oof. That is just cooked perfectly. Look at that skin. <laughs> mm -mm. Oh. Mm. 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 Wow. Totally taste the garlic, totally taste the onion. The pepper adds such a level, I know. So simple, but so good. And of course, salt is a flavor enhancer. Takes it up a notch. I got a piece here with the caramelized onion, little garlic on the end. Oh man, mmm. Salad time, mix it around. Got some feta, some cucumber, tomato, and Kalamata olive. Mm. 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 That is just what the doctor ordered. Wait a minute, I am the doctor and I did order it. <laughs> Man, the salad is actually fantastic. I didn't show making the salad because I figure it's pretty simple. But as long as you know the ingredients, you can recreate that. So this is the first time I actually severed the uh, spine of the fish. 
to see if I could keep it from curling and I scored the skin too and it sure did work. I'm gonna set that aside because it's got some good cheek steaks on it too. Don't forget your cheek steak right there. Well I hope I filmed eating the eyeball just now because if I didn't, whoops, they were good. That was amazing. Every bit got eaten up. Pack out what you pack in. Now each stream is different. So out here we have a five fish maximum. So that's your limit. You do have to have a fishing license and other bodies of water may have different regulations. So you need to make sure you look up the name of that specific stream or lake wherever you're headed and you can check in the Department of Fish and Wildlife freshwater fishing regulations. I've used a lot of different methods over the years to fish, but in my eyes, the most effective way to catch fish in the Sierra Nevadas is with spoons and spinners. Well, thank you for watching. Please consider giving us a like, leaving a comment, hit that bell-shaped notification icon and hit all. That way you'll know when our next video drops. And until next time, Keep the old ways alive. Join us next time as we continue our introduction to freediving and spearfishing the California Coast series. We're headed out targeting purple and red sea urchin for a one of a kind sea urchin salsa. Yes, just uh, landed a trout with uh, half a pole. <laughs>